All right, welcome to lecture seven of CS182. Today, we're going to talk about how to actually get neural nets to train well. So uh, in this lecture, uh, basically, we're going to talk about the following issue. If you follow all the stuff that I suggested in previous lectures, you set up your neural network, and then you try to train it, and things aren't quite working, uh, even if you implemented everything correctly, and you train it for a really long time, that's not that unusual. So remember, neural network optimization landscapes are uh, problematic. They're full of monsters and dragons. And the neural networks are messy. They require lots of tricks to train well. And knowing those tricks is really important for good results, just as important as understanding all of the theoretical nuances. So we'll talk about some of the most important uh, of these tricks today. We're going to talk about how we can normalize or standardize inputs and outputs. Uh, we're going to talk about normalizing activations. We'll discuss a technique called batch normalization, which can be really, really helpful. We'll discuss how we can initialize weight matrices and bias vectors. We'll talk about some techniques to get more uh, well-behaved gradients, and then a few best practices about hyperparameter optimization, uh, as well as some uh, nice techniques for ensembling, regularization, dropout, that sort of thing. So let's uh, start with normalization. And uh, I'll first explain why this is an issue, and then I'll discuss some techniques that can actually be really useful uh, for making your neural nets train better. Let's uh, first discuss a setting where there's no problem, kind of an easy setting. So let's say that you have the neural network that I drew above. It takes in a two-dimensional input. And uh, let's say that our data points, some of them maybe look like this, right? So here, each little graph is a data point, and uh, it's two-dimensional, and the bars represent the two dimensions, x1 and x2. Now, uh, usually you would have uh, higher dimensional inputs, but here they're two-dimensional, just to make it easy to draw. Okay, so here everything looks normal, x1 and x2 vary, uh, and this is kind of a standard setting where we'd expect everything would work well. Here's a hard case. Okay. Now, just from looking at these graphs, uh, again, as a reminder, every graph represents a uh, different data point, and the two bars represent the two dimensions of that data point. Why do you think the case on the right would be so much harder than the case on the left? Well, the only real difference here is that for the hard case on the right, the first dimension is on a very different scale from the second dimension. So the first dimension on the right is always way bigger. It's both bigger in the sense that its numerical value is larger and its range is larger. Now, the actual information represented by these data points might even be exactly the same. It could be that if you were to rescale the bars for the data points on the right, you might get uh, things that look exactly the same as the distribution on the left. This kind of thing can actually happen pretty frequently with real world data, uh, especially if you're combining data with different types. So for instance, if you, if you have a feature vector consisting of some distances in kilometers and some speeds expressed in terms of uh, you know, meters per second or something, those might be on very different scales. Uh, now, you would hope that your network would be relatively resilient to those kinds of differences, like you know, what's the difference between representing a speed in uh, meters per second versus miles per hour, right? Uh, but it can actually make a really big difference. To understand why the case on the right is so difficult for neural net optimization, let's think about the exp expression for the derivative at a particular layer. Let's take, for example, the first linear layer. And let's look at the derivative of the loss with respect to w1. Um, just from the chain rule and from our discussion of backpropagation before, we know, we know that dl dw1 is dz1 dw1 times dl dz1. And dl dz1 is just the, the delta vector in backpropagation. Right, uh, and we saw in the backpropagation lecture uh, that if we, uh, you know, derive everything and work out what this derivative is equal to, it's just going to be the outer product between delta, which is the vector that we're backpropagating, and x transpose. So x is the input to the layer, and then we transpose it. But now, in the hard case, we know that the different dimensions of x have very different magnitudes, which means that delta x transpose will also have very different magnitudes for different rows. 
So that means that the, the derivatives with respect to our uh, weight matrix will be very different in magnitude for different dimensions of that weight matrix. All right. So some of the derivatives will be very large and some will be very small. In the easy case where the magnitude of x is about the same for every dimension, you'd expect that the magnitude of the derivative for the different weight uh, uh, matrix entries would also look kind of similar. So in the easy case, that means that our, our objective landscape might be well behaved like this. So the gradient steps actually point towards at least a local optimum. Whereas in the hard case, because the different uh, entries in the, in the derivative will have very different magnitudes, we'll be much closer to the, the difficult case we saw before, where the direction of steepest descent doesn't actually point towards the optimum, and we end up taking a lot of little steps as we move towards it. And of course, you know, various improvements to the optimization algorithm can mitigate this problem to a degree, but this is uh, definitely a problem that's there. So in general, we really want all the entries in our input to be roughly on the same scale. Oftentimes, this is not actually a problem. For example, if, you are, if your input consists of images, like in the ConNet lecture last time, all the pixels are basically going to be in the, in the range from 0 to 1 or 0 to 55, depending on how you're representing your image. So oftentimes for images, we don't have to worry about this because the different pixels are probably already going to be on the same scale. In domains where we have discrete inputs, like natural language processing, all the inputs might be one hot vectors, in which case uh, we also don't have to worry about this because all of our inputs are just going to be zeros or ones. Right? Uh, so here, this is not an issue. But sometimes this can be a huge problem. Imagine, for instance, that you're building a neural network to forecast the weather. Some of the dimensions of your inputs might be temperature. Maybe that ranges kind of roughly in the tens to low hundreds. Uh, and some entries are humidity, which are uh, percentages, basically, so they're fractions, and they might range between 0 and 1. Now you have different inputs uh, that are on very different scales, and the resulting gradients will be poorly conditioned, and uh, the network will also be biased towards paying attention to the larger numbers before it pays attention to the smaller numbers, even though they're not necessarily more um, important for the prediction problem. So this is a pretty big issue in practice if you have um, real valued inputs like this. So what do we do? Well, uh, what we can do is something called standardization. This is also sometimes referred to as normalization, but technically standardization is the, is the proper term for it, which is that we will just transform our inputs so that they tend to have means of zero and standard deviations of one. And crucially, we can make, make this transformation without actually changing anything about the information contained in the inputs. So uh, if the distribution of your inputs looks like this, let's say they're you know, roughly normally distributed, but there's a lot more variability along one axis than another axis, standardization would somehow transform them so that there's about the same variation along each axis, and each axis is centered at zero. So all you have to do if you want the mean to be zero is just subtract the mean from every dimension of x. So for every data point in your data set, xi, you're going to compute a transform data point, xi bar, which is just equal to xi minus the expected value of x. And the expected value of x, that's the mean, you just estimate it by averaging all the x's in your data set. Very, very simple. If you want to also make the standard deviation one, then you do the same exact thing, but then you also divide by the square root of the expected value of xi minus the expected value of x squared which is just the standard deviation of uh, x in the data set. So subtract the mean, divide by the standard deviation. All of these operations are, of course, per dimension. So for every dimension of x, you perform this operation. This doesn't change the information contained in the data, right? You, all, all you've done is subtract some constant and divide it by a constant. But it does make your data uh, have zero mean and unit uh, variance for every dimension, which prevents this kind of awkward scaling problem. Okay, so if you have real valued inputs and you suspect they might be on different scales, this is a really good idea to do. If you have images or one-hot vectors, which is actually often the case in deep learning, then you don't have to worry about it as much. It's also a good idea to do this for outputs if you're solving a regression problem. So again, if you're solving a classification problem, your outputs are just labels, there's nothing to standardize. But if you're doing regression, if you're predicting real values, it also helps to standardize the outputs in the training set. Okay. But can we also standardize activations? So even if our 
inputs are pixels that are all on the same scale, or one hot vectors that are all on the same scale, maybe our activations might solve some problems. And maybe standardizing those could actually be a really good idea. So what if uh, our X's are well behaved, we start seeing really different scales for different dimensions somewhere in the middle, maybe for the activation vector A1 or something. Well, perhaps we could just standardize the activations also. We basically can. The only di issue with doing that is that now the mean and standard deviation of your activations will actually change during training. Right? The mean and standard deviation of X is not going to change as you train your network more because the network doesn't affect X. But the mean and standard deviation of some activation vector in the middle of your network will change over the course of training. So let's figure out how to do this. The basic idea is very straightforward. Uh, let's say that we're trying to standardize the activations at layer one. So perhaps we have uh, Z1 is equal to W1X plus B1. Um, then we apply a ReLU, and then let's standardize after the ReLU. Uh, so then we'll calculate uh, our mean, which is just the average per dimension uh, of uh, every entry in that activation vector. And we'll calculate our standard deviation, which is the square root of the average of the squared difference, just like before. And then we'll compute a1 bar for every data point i as a1i minus mu1 divided by sigma1. Okay, Exactly the same as before. The difference now, of course, is that mu and sigma themselves depend on uh, parameters of the network. But then, And then we just use a bar in place of a later on. So this is kind of the basic idea behind something called batch normalization. Batch normalization aims to standardize the activations at every layer so as to ensure that your gradients are well behaved and to prevent some dimensions from being much larger than other dimensions. And then we just continue evaluating this network forward. So the, the main problem with, with uh, the naive version of batch normalization that I outlined on this slide is that because the, the mean and standard deviation depend on W1 and, w and B1, you have to recompute them every time the parameters of your neural network change. Now the parameters of your neural network, they change with every single gradient step. So that means that after every single gradient step, you have, this naive version of the method needs to go over every single data point, calculate its activations, and use that to figure out mu and sigma. But remember, when we're using mini-batch gradient descent, every gradient step is only computed using a small subset of the points. So if we now have to go over every point in our data set anyway, just to compute mu and sigma, this is going to be extremely expensive. And we would very much like to avoid that. All right, so what we're actually going to do in batch normalization is more or less use mini-batches to estimate mu and sigma. And that's why it's called batch normalization, because it normalizes over a batch. So instead of estimating the mean by averaging the activations over every data point in the data set, we will estimate the mean by averaging together the activations of all the data points in the batch. So if you assume that the batch has capital B uh, elements, and the indices of those elements are I1 through IB, then uh, this equation will give you the mean over the batch. And we do exactly the same thing for the standard deviation. Instead of computing the standard deviation over the entire data set, we compute it only over the batch. And this is basically the main idea behind batch normalization. A practical implementation uh, is going to be a little bit different. In a practical uh, implementation, the real version of batch norm, we would also have two additional parameters for our activations, which I'm going to call gamma and beta. So the issue is that after we subtract the mean and divide by the standard deviation, our activations will be in a particular range. Uh, specifically, they'll have a standard deviation of 1 and a mean of 0. But we might not actually want that going into the next layer. So we might want to then have a transformation on them by multiplying them by a scale and adding a bias. So we have this learnable scale and bias, uh, which are vectors, uh, and they have the same dimensionality as, um, as the activations. So in the same way that you have a, a bias vector uh, for, for a linear layer, now you have a scale vector and a bias vector. 
Now, the standard version of batch normalization adds these parameters and trains them just like the parameters of any layer. Although, if you leave them out, from my experience, things basically all still work. And in fact, for this way of doing uh, batch normalization where you put it after the ReLU, in fact, the beta parameter is actually redundant with the bias at the next linear layer, B2. But the standard textbook version of batch normalization has these parameters, so in our description we'll have them. Okay, so you can think of batch normalization as basically a layer that performs this operation. So batch normalization is a layer that calculates mu and sigma from all the activations going into the batch norm layer in the current batch, and then it has parameters, gamma and beta, which are both vectors of the same size as the number of activations. And all the operations here are point-wise, uh, meaning that uh, they're per dimension. For every dimension, uh, you perform these operations. Okay, so that's basically batch normalization in a nutshell. If you want to train a network with batch normalization, just do exactly what we did in the backprop lecture. Just use backpropagation, and as an exercise, you can figure out what the derivatives with respect to the batch norm parameters and with respect to the batch norm input are. Uh, remember, from our discussion of backprop, all you have to do is for every layer that you add, you have to be able to calculate the derivative uh, with respect to its input times delta and the derivative with respect to its parameters times delta. As long as you can compute those quantities, then you can plug that layer into backpropagation. If you want to figure out the derivatives, you can do this uh, at home on your own time. It's a little bit tedious with a lot of calculus, but it's reasonably straightforward. So just using regular uh, single va variable calculus identities, you can work out the derivatives of uh, batch normalization with respect to the quantity that goes in, which in our case is A, and with respect to its parameters, gamma and beta. And once you have those derivatives figured out, then you can just plug it into uh, regular backpropagation. All right, now one question we have to answer before we can actually use batch normalization in practice is where we should put these batch normalization layers. And conventionally, what we would do is we would put the batch normalization layers after every normal layer, after every linear layer, for example, but we still have a choice as to whether to put them before or after the nonlinearity. So these two diagrams show the two choices. We can either have a linear layer and then a ReLU or a sigmoid and then batch norm and then another linear layer and then another ReLU and another batch norm, or we can have linear layer, batch norm, then ReLU, linear layer, batch norm, then ReLU, linear layer, batch norm, then ReLU. Which of these choices is better? Uh, well, both of them have actually been used, uh, and they both work. Putting the batch norm after the ReLU, has, it's a little bit weird because you have the scale and bias, and seemingly it should be subsumed by the next layer, because like the bias in the batch norm layer is redundant with the bias of the following linear layer, so why have it? Um, yeah, and you don't have to, you could leave it out. Um, the other thing is that all the outputs of a ReLU are positive, and batch norm will make something negative by subtracting the mean, but maybe that's okay. If you put the batch norm before the ReLU, that's actually the classic version, uh, the one described in the original batch norm paper. But it also looks like just a transformation on the preceding linear layer. Um, that's okay. Uh, and uh, actually, both of these variants will work. No one seems to agree on what the right way to, do, to use batch norm is. Uh, and you know, probably the thing to do if you want to try it out is to try both those options and see what works or just pick one arbitrarily, because they'll both actually work decently well. All right, a few considerations about batch norm uh, that are good to keep in mind if you're going to use it in practice. If you do use batch norm, you can often use a larger learning rate. The reason you can use a larger learning rate is because it's going to make your derivatives more well conditioned. Remember how uh, it'll prevent, uh, to some degree, uh, these really awkward, uh, awkwardly scaled uh, objective landscapes where some dimensions have much bigger gradients than others, by putting everything roughly into a spherical Gaussian, uh, it will keep your derivatives better behaved, which will allow you to use a larger learning rate. So you would often want to use a larger learning rate with batch norm, and that works better. Models with batch norm tend to train a lot faster. Uh, so this is a, an experiment on, on the MNIST data set from the original batch norm paper, 
the blue curve is with batch norm, the dotted black line is without batch norm. And you can see that with batch norm, it gets up, this is accuracy, so higher is better, it gets up to a higher accuracy much, much faster. It almost looks like it actually starts at a higher accuracy. That's not actually true, it just gets there so fast that you can't see it in the graph. Um, and generally, models trained with batch norm also require less regularization. So we'll talk about something called dropout towards the end of today's lecture. With batch norm, you typically wouldn't use it. Um, it's not clear why they require less generalization, but that seems to be the case. So batch norm is actually a very, very good idea in many cases. Uh, and uh, especially if you're training a larger, deeper network, batch norm can make it train a lot better. It can make your derivatives better behaved, and it can allow you to use larger learning rates. A few details with batch norm. Uh, if you do use it, you know, the classic version does have these gamma and beta parameters. You could omit them. It will reduce the number of parameters in your model. Oftentimes, it'll still work. Um, when you actually deploy a network trained with batch norm, if you want at test time to run the network on individual data points, uh, now your batch norm layers will have nothing to, to normalize over. So oftentimes, what we do after we train a network with batch norm is we actually uh, compute mu and sigma on the whole data set, and then we freeze them. So that at test time, we don't actually estimate mu and sigma on the batch, we just directly use the mu and sigma that has been computed from the training set. And after we've done that, then uh, the batch norm parameters, in principle, can just be folded in with either the following linear layer, if the batch norm is after the nonlinearity, or the preceding linear layer, if it's before the nonlinearity. So you can basically bake in uh, mu, sigma, gamma, and beta into a linear layer and just remove the batch norm layer altogether if you want. Or you can keep it and just freeze mu and sigma, basically just store their numerical values based on the mu and sigma in the data set. And then your deployed network uh, can be evaluated even on a single data point, just like a regular neural net. Okay, so that's basically batch norm. 